Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, and welcome back to Decoding AQ. Today, I'm joined by Andy Kriebel. He's a mathematician, a trainer, and an incredibly distinguished figure in the realm of data visualization and a truly influential leader in the world of data analytics. So welcome to the show, Andy. Thank you, Ross. So Andy's journey has spanned you know, multiple decades and it's seen him evolve into the master trainer and a revered member of Tableau's Visionary Hall of Fame. He's not just an expert, he's a mentor who has shaped the careers of countless data professionals through his innovative training courses and community leadership initiatives. In fact, he's led and implemented data visualization programs at Facebook, Coca-Cola, and authored the book Makeover Monday with Eva Murray. And really what drew me to Andy was his passion about helping individuals and organizations unlock the power of data to drive their business decisions. So I want to dig into that. And I wanted to find out more. How can we really leverage data to manifest the kind of changes in the world that I and many of our community would love to see. And when he's not transforming the data landscape, he embraces the outdoors, be it hiking, running marathons, or conquering triathlons. He's a dynamic life that is a testament to adaptability in action. So join us as we join, as we delve into this multifaceted world of Andy and where data meets determination, innovation, and adaptability. So I want to start off with Andy. What brought you to the UK from the US? Oh, great question. So I, I was working at Facebook before I moved over to the UK, and I was running the data visualization um, practice there, implementing Tableau, and I got to travel the world a lot to do training at Facebook offices on data analysis and data visualization. And I came to London in 20. 14, in the summer of 2014 to speak at a conference. And my then wife, my ex now, uh, she came along with me. She has a history degree um, and she really loved it here. And we were like, you know what? Why don't we think about moving abroad? We always wanted to have uh, an experience living abroad for our kids. It's one of those things where the kids don't realize it's actually good for them in the long run, but they're 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 graduate, gradually realizing that. So so we packed up four kids, moved them overseas, and I helped start uh, the data school. So the data school is a is a training program that takes cohorts of people in, trains them up, gives them kind of top notch data analytical skills, and then they go do two years of consulting. Now I left that company back in uh, November of 2023, so about almost exactly a month ago, to start my own business, doing similar things. But um, I have a six month old daughter, and uh, I wanted to change my life a bit and get some time back and spend more time at home and spend more time with her because in America, you don't get any holiday, or you don't get it not holiday, you don't get any paternity leave. So I had four kids there with my ex and got zero days of leave. So it's been quite a different experience for me here. And I decided, you know what, now's the time. Very cool. I, I think it's interesting, isn't it? As we look back over our lives and we analyze certain things and you, you mentioned, you know, a decision that we make that affects others that we know it'll be good for them in the long run. Yeah. They put up a stink at the, at the start, right? Be that kids, be that team members. And often many of us don't really adapt. We don't want to change. We don't change our decisions or our behaviors or our actions, even when the data says we should. Why is that? That's a good question. I think because people get used to things and people don't like change. Uh, my, my kids all took it very, very differently. It was very interesting. My oldest son never really adapted well to living here. Um, and he he moved back the first chance he got. Uh, so he moved back to America during COVID. Uh, he dropped out of university here and just wanted to move back, which is fine. Um, I then have, I have twins that one of them goes to university in Tennessee and the other one goes to university in the Netherlands. And they both had great experiences moving here. And then my youngest son is kind of somewhere in between. He, he enjoys it at times and he complains about it and others just to complain. Uh, so it's they've all taken very different experiences, but they are gradually, the older three kids in particular, are starting to realize how good this experience has been for them. And I talk to them about it. I'm like, 
you know, this is something you should talk about when you're interviewing for a job. Um, it's been, you know, talk about how difficult of a change it was for you and how you had to leave your friends and meet all these new people and move to a different culture and start taking public transportation by yourself. Uh, that's a whole novel concept, right? That just doesn't happen in America unless you live in New York, basically. And so adaptability was was very key for them, but change was the hardest thing for sure. It was very difficult for them to to change. And I think that's just with people in general, they get comfortable and change is scary and they don't like taking risks. And that's just kind of the way they want to lead their life. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but that's not the way I live. So tell me about you then. So if that was through the lens of that experience um, of your children, for you, what were some of the data points that led you to live in there? Circumstance, environment, decisions, choices, you and your wife of doing it. And yeah. what what really led that um, that shift from, you know, taking a family up uh, uproot it and go and plonk it somewhere else. Yeah. So back in the, in the mid two thousands, I worked for a consulting firm. I was a project management consultant and we had a team of software developers. Some of them were on site in St. Louis and some of them were in Vietnam. And I went to visit the team in Vietnam, um, I learned to speak Vietnamese. I don't, don't speak it anymore, but, uh, and that got me thinking about, wow, this has been just just being there a couple of weeks has been just a transformational cultural experience for me. And I talked to my wife about it and we we're like, you know, what do you think about moving to Vietnam? And of course you're like, wow, that's, that's kind of out there. Right. And I started exploring it with the company and they were very on board with it. They needed kind of more senior leaders over there, uh, especially to help with the communication between the US and, and Vietnam. And that our daughter started progressing and then it, it sort of fell apart because of uh, one of the managers got sick and um, it just you know kind of fell apart at that point. And this, and, and moving to London, just the opportunity was there. Um, we, it's an English speaking country, which makes it much easier, of course. Um, and, it was about the right time to do it. It was one of those things. Again, it was the it was the right opportunity for me with the company that I joined. They were looking for somebody that did what I do, and I was looking to do what I love to do. So the two, it, the really a lot of it was timing. It just worked out worked out really well, and the decision to move actually wasn't that difficult uh, for for us to make because we had already moved from Atlanta to California. And that's a, that's a big cultural difference as well. You know, the South of the U S versus the West coast is very, very different. Um, so, so that was a, that was probably a harder transition maybe because it was the first move I'm thinking uh, where moving, you know, it's actually about the same distance between Atlanta and California as it is Atlanta to the UK. So that's not really that, that, that big of a difference, but we wanted our kids to have that that cultural experience, and and when when we experienced that ourselves, and the timing of when that happened, and where I was in my career, and what I wanted to do, all those things aligned very well. And it kind of comes to this model of you know the input process outcome. You know we take in some inputs, we do something in the middle yeah. of it, process, we'll experience it, we might if it's data visualize it, we live it. And then we're predicting an outcome that we would like, and then we'll, you know, get some feedback, put it in the input, go through the process and mm. continually kind of revolve around that modeling to move us towards outcomes and performance that we're looking for and away from outcomes and performance that we don't want. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm interested in terms of then, was that a conversation? Did you involve everybody in the family in that to get them to, you know, present their ideas or why they thought it would be a good idea or not a good idea? What was the kind of process you went through? And is there any similarities that you brought from your kind of career work side when they met? Oh, there's a big decision. Should we launch this new product? Should we, you know, go to this new territory? And it's often a collaborative approach from different domains, different people involved. Did that happen the same for you and the family? No, no. It was two of us that made the decision. We knew okay. yeah. what the answers would be from other people. Uh, the answers would have been no from everybody else. Uh, and that's not what we wanted. And that's not what we thought was best for our children. Uh, the kids were 
probably too young at that point. You know, they they would have had an opinion, but yeah. You know, my oldest was uh, let's see, so he was 14 when we moved here. So, you know, I had, you know, it was getting to that teenage phase and making the friends and all that. And my twins were 13. So it was, they would have had an opinion, but, um, you know, if, if we're asking them to do that now when they're twenties, I think it's very different. You would weigh their, um, you know, their, their input a lot more than it'd be a much bigger data point, I guess, much more yeah. weighted data point than it was then. Um, we kept it primarily to ourselves. We didn't really involve our family because we didn't want to upset them or um, my parents probably would have been ex exceptionally supportive of it. I don't think my ex-wife's parents would have been because they would don't want their, you know, grandchildren to live that far yeah. away. But I've, I've been gone from my parents since I left for university. So me being away isn't new to them. Um, so yeah, I, I think it would, we would have had a lot of conflicting information and I think it would have made the decision more, difficult than it needed to be it would have cluttered our minds too much that's an interesting point because a lot of people leaders in organizations now have an overwhelm of data right opinion cluttered noise yeah. all of those things and do you think there's an element because we can get data because we can visualize it we think we need more of it to make good decisions versus I know what I'm doing. This is my gut. This is my instinct. It's the right decision for us, even if there are those noises from other people that it's going to impact. But I, I'm gonna gonna lead that. Do you think we've lost that a bit, or do you still see it in the work that you do? Between you know, let's just get as much information, make decisions from it, versus I can just thin slice this. I can see the key bits. I'm going to act, and I'm going to go. What's your view around that kind of paradox world? Companies want all of the data when they're because they don't they don't know any different. They they hear they need to be data driven. It's kind of you know one of those buzzwords and all this. And they're like, give me all the data, give me all the data. Analysts and companies are the same way, and I I try to do the opposite approach. I try to look at well, what's the minimum amount that I need to make the decision, but you have to know the question that you're trying to answer before you decide what data you need. So you know if I want to track. Um, let's say I want to make a decision on whether we relocate the company. There's a certain amount of information I need to make that decision. And I should start with the smallest amount of information I need to make that decision. And then if it's not clear from that, um, and if it doesn't align with kind of what my gut thinks, or not necessarily align, but you know, they're, they're two separate data points, I guess. But if I need, if it doesn't uh, make things clear for me, then I go get more data and I just get more data as I need it, where a lot of companies start the other way around. They start with everything and then they're stuck in this mess and they can't figure out how to simplify things. So I, I think people make it more complicated than they need to. But your gut is also a very important part of that as well. Um, you know, for, for me, when I decided to make this decision to go out on my own, that was almost purely a gut decision. I'd never done sales before. I've never run my own business. I've never tried to get a customer. I've never done any of that before, yet I still made that leap because I felt like it was the right thing. Um, all the data was probably telling me not to do it. I think many vo veterans of businesses wouldn't start another one if they knew what it entailed, right? It started by <laughs> naive people, right? Who don't yeah. know any better, who don't realize, Jesus, this is a tough show. Yeah. And then by then you, you, you're in, you, you're just in that, in that system. And it, 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 it raises another thought in my mind and this, this question. And uh, I remember years ago when Malcolm Gladwell's book Blink came out Yeah. and it had a massive impact on me. As a, I've been an entrepreneur, Andy, f you know, for 25 years, always run my own things and been, you know, really struggling through my own evolution of when is it? No, this is my decision um, versus I need to make this decision with other people so they feel good about it versus I don't know what the decision is. I need some help in making the decision and right. that kind of arc through it from overconfidence to imposter syndrome to totally don't know and being okay with I don't know I think is a maturity as a business owner or as a leader to be okay with not having answers and mm -hmm. asking for data and asking for opinions versus what well, do you made my decision Andy can you present me some data that'll help back up my decision 
Uh, I didn't present it to you in that way, but that's really what's going on. And I've seen that so much, right? Mm -hmm. You can gather the data for it. So if we're thinking about, we've got too much, it's overwhelming. You said, start with what the question is that you're trying to solve. If we've got the right question, how do we then, you know, what's the process or the questions you'd advise leaders to then see which are the data points that are most valuable? Is there a process to doing that part? If you've got a question, what's the next part? Yeah. It, so that's where like, you know, me as a consultant, that's a bit different, or it can be an analyst within a company. It doesn't really matter whoever's working on that project. Right. So, so the, the boss says they, you know, they, this is the question they, or this is the question they want to answer. Well, then you need to ask them why, you know, why is that the question they want to answer? And you just start digging in that way. And then you get to the point like, okay, I, I now have all the information I need to complete that for, uh, you know, and then you give, you repeat that back to the stakeholder, right? To the boss and say, Hey, this is what I'm hearing. This is what I think we need to answer this question. Do you agree? And if they don't, you keep going through that conversation, but then you figure out, well, which data do I, do I have the data to support those questions? If I don't have the data to support those questions, I got a decision to make. Uh, if I can't get the data, well, then I have to either replace that question with something else or make a decision that it's just not important or we can't answer it, right? It's just something we don't know. It can't influence our decision. But if we do have the data, it's like, okay, well, how much of it do we need? Um, you know, which parts of that data do we need? Do we, you know, if it's if it comes from a table that has 100 columns in it, how many of those 100 columns do we actually need? Probably three. Right? What level of aggregation of the data do we need? So you're just trying to gradually simplify those. And that's where, as you do that drilling down into the why, typically it's going to be when you get to that lowest level of granularity through those questions, everything else can be aggregated from that question. Right, So that's your kind of basis of the data. And then you answer the different questions. And I guess there's so much complexity into accuracy, speed of it, You know whether it's, you know, uh, leading, lagging, all, all of these kind of complexities when you scratch under the skin and go into the the rabbit hole of data analytics, data visualization, and, and all of those things. And from the other side, when there isn't data and we're trying to imagine and we're trying to create and we're doing something that hasn't been done before, mm -hmm. and maybe data then becomes the ball and chain instead of the springboard. Are there indicators that you've observed or seen that are, starts to emerge when that starts to happen, when data starts to be the actual um, barrier to mm. imagination, to transformation, to pivoting to something else? Because we're so, as you mentioned before, we hate change, we like comfort, all mm. of these things. And I get an applause. I can find some data that says an applause. It's a check written. It's a client saying, well done. It's a market saying, yes, we want it whatever it may be to yep. nobody knew we needed it. We didn't see that that was the solution. We are emerging a future issue um, that we might see in science fiction or things like that. And we're now trying to flip to predictions and imagination. And mm. what are the leaps that you, you're, you would recommend or think about or for people that are leading other people to consider when you're going into more, areas of uncertainty or areas of prediction or areas of imagination? There's a couple things. I think you have to be okay with saying you don't know the answer and you can't get the answer, right? So um, I guess that's part of failure, right? You you want to analyze this question. Um, the, you, it's impossible to get the data. You have to be okay with, you have to be okay with that situation. Um, if if it's a situation where you're not sure you can get the data, but you want to continue progressing the project while you go look for that data, you can always create fake data sets, right? That's where where things like ChatGPT come in super handy for, you know, like I use it all the time and it gives me Python scripts to create these random data sets. I'm like, I don't know Python, but it gives me what I need, right? Uh, and that way I can keep progressing on the project. I can start building out the visualizations and the analysis, and then I could just plug and play the other data when I get it. Um, but that also helps me know, well, 
does the structure of the data that I think I need, does that work? If not, I can refine that with ChatGPT while they still go off and look the data. And then once they find the data, you give that to the data engineers and say, hey, this is the shape I need this data in. I need these columns, um, this information. Oh, sorry, of course, my daughter calls right in the middle of a call like she does every time. Um, She's got a knack for for calling when only when I'm on the phone. It, it's similar to my wife, Andy. You know, I'll be I'm I'm recording a podcast, I'm recording a podcast, and then you know the WhatsApp calls comes in. Yeah, yeah. at the bottom of the garden in the recording studio, yeah. she'll be in the house or whatever. Yeah, happens all the exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, but I can then give the data engineer the structure of the data that I need, which is. In the end, it's easier for them, right? They they typically go off and they get as much data as they can find because they're unsure of what you need. But that's where you have to be able to iterate on that process with the data engineer. But it makes their job much easier if you tell them, this is these are the columns I need. This is the types of aggregations I'm going to use. Um, can you get it in this format for me? If they can't, well, then you have to figure out, well, why? Uh, can we do something different? You know, can we, if we structure the data, well, what way can you structure the data? What data can you get? And then I feed that back into, you know, my my dummy data and revise that and see how that works with the project I'm working. So it's that, that iterative constant cycle that you go through of um, yes and no, and maybe, and, you know, uh, two steps forward, five steps back and, you know, that, that whole process before you get to the finish line. And it very much what you've described there is a creative process. Yeah. Right. And, and what we're and it's not limited to just data either. No. I mean, that's the same. Yeah, data comes process in so many anything. formats. Right. Yeah. It comes in all sorts of formats, uh, you know, from, you know, digital data to felt data. You know, how does my body react to certain things? To, yeah. Uh, what's the impact that it's having on other people's emotions or in the marketplace or on our planet? All sorts of various things. Um, and some that we can't even describe yet with our current level of technology and ability, right? That there's data that we can't explain certain things. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by this, you know, how do we help people make good decisions when they're under incredible pressure and stress and teams and organizations? Because, you know, and a part of why we exist is to ensure no one's left behind in this fastest period of change in history. So if everything's in shift, uh, all different industries, every different work type is evolving, that maybe the tens of millions of programmers in five or 10 years now, time, there won't be programmers. We will just speak it and it will happen. You know, where computers, I talk about it a lot, used to be the, a job role. That was the name of a job. Now it's a physical object. How many names of jobs will become a piece of software or a conversation? And I'm interested uh, around things like data gathering, data analysts, all of those things, because that was a, God, everybody needs a data scientist and uh, every organization needs them because we've got so much of it and we don't know what to do with it. We need to figure it out to make better decisions. Right? Who should we hire? What should we develop? Where's the next problem? What can we foresee? All of those kind of things to generate impact, growth, whether that's um, private, public, non-for-profit, whatever organization we rally around. And I've got a couple of couple of pieces. One is, you know, you've coached yourself a lot of people in training, in their own careers, in their own success. And I'm, I'm interested in discussing the sort of situation where allowing somebody to struggle or even fail or not provide certain data points is a better lesson for them than direct men mentorship. You know, it's like as a parent, oh, don't touch that. Don't touch that. It's hot. It's hot. Well, they're never really going to get the right data point till they touch it themselves. And they go, oh, yeah, it is bloody hot in there. And so how in that kind of process of coaching people, have you sort of recognized and looked at situations from I've got the data, or I can give them the answer, or I can give them the piece versus I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let them fail. And th that is a more effective way and lesson um, during the careers and coaching and mentorship that evolves around people development. So failing is for me, the best way to learn, I fail all the time, right? I, I make mistakes, I do a calculation wrong, whatever whatever it might be. Um, I'm trying to learn a new technique and I screw it up. That's, to me, one of the struggles I want the people that I train to go through as well. 
So, you know, I, I could step in, like you said, I could step in and fix the problem for them, but that doesn't teach them anything. So I want them to fail for a couple of different reasons. One, to recognize that they failed, right? They, they may not think they did. If they didn't, I give them that feedback. Second is what got them there, right? So how did they get to the point where they failed? Uh, so what steps can they do next time to prevent that? Uh, the third thing is when should they ask for help? So how do they, you know, the only way for them to learn when to ask for help is to fail. And then they start recognizing when they're about to fail and then they learn when to ask for help. So those are three of the most important parts of that, of that equation. Um, but I do let them fail if they don't ask me for help. But if they ask me for help, I'll help them learn on the spot. Um, if they're asking a question that I think they know the answer for already, but they're a bit unsure, I'll have them explain it back to me. And I'll say, well, what, do you, what would you do here? You know, what's the next step you would take? Yes, I could give you the answer, but I think you know the answer. You know, you need to have the confidence to tell me what the answer is. This is the safe space, right? I'm, I, you're not, I respect you for asking the questions. I want you to ask the questions. That's, you know, that to me shows uh, ambition to learn. But I need you to also tell me, you know, well, you know, what process did you go through to get here? Where do you think you went wrong? So it's it's not me just stepping in and giving the answer. I want to go through all those same those same um, questions with them, those same situations with them, so that they rec I can help them recognize when they should have asked the question. Where's the step where they went wrong? Why was it wrong? Um, and what should they have done instead? And I think in a in an environment and paradigm where the terms of the relationship allow that to happen, and that's fostered a lot in training, right? Training, yeah. coaching, that environment, that's kind of, cool, I signed up for that, Andy. I right. want to be interrogated. I want my workings to be picked over. I want the you know red crosses and the green ticks. <laughs> and I want to be getting closer to being better each time. And that's what the relationship and the, the terms of that has been. If the relationship and the environment and paradigm isn't one traditionally in, I've come in on a course, I'm coming to be coached, I'm doing that, and it's a day-to-day -day stuff, right? right. Projects to hit, I'm under pressure, this is over budget, I'm late on this, a fire's just come in because of this issue with this client, trying to do all of that, and yet I'm still required to learn, not know the answer, do those things, and I'm working with other people. In that context, can that same approach apply? What needs to be different or what styles of leadership or coaching or training? Because I, I hear a lot about companies want to embed a coaching culture um, and continual learning. And it's this paradox between the environment when you are coaching and learning is very different to then applying that when you've still got stuff to be done, projects right. to deliver, things to go out the door. In your opinion, uh, can it be the same? Is it just a conversation? Is there a different style? Do we have to adapt? What are the rules of the game in that? Or what's the playbook around that mm. to get the, the best outcomes in your view? Yeah, it depends on whether your supervisor, let's call this, let's call the person a supervisor, is a manager, or if they are um, a coach or a coach and a mentor, right? I, I think they should be a combination of those things, but the traditional manager is you didn't do this. I will tell you that once a year at your performance review, you will not, you, these shall not learn along the way um, where, you know, a, a good manager will help you along the way. They'll want to do similar coaching to what I do when I'm training people, right? They should be asking people, show me what you're working on. Uh, if they don't make time to, to do that with their employees, they're failing their employees, right? You, you should try to make your people so good that they don't need to work for you anymore that they're better than you are and they need to go on and do something else. That's your job as a manager or as a, as a supervisor or a leader. Um, so I think it can happen similarly. Of course, it's not going to be exactly the same way, but too many companies have, have made it a negative thing to ask questions and to ask for help where they should be seeing that as a strength. So, I think it's an attitude adjustment that companies need to make. Um, traditional companies still think that way and people leave because they don't get that support they need. Uh, more modern, I guess, quote unquote, modern companies are much more open to those sorts of situations. 
And people love those environments because it means they get to learn. It means it's okay if they make a mistake. You know, they're not worried about being fired if they make a mistake. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think companies really need to look hard at themselves and determine how do they want their employees to grow. Um, if they're worried about giving their employees training because they might leave, well, that's a bit of a problem because the opposite of that is you don't give them any training and they stay. So um, you have to pick your poison, I guess, right? Yeah. So you could have, you could continue to have lots of mediocre people in your company, or they could, you could have a few people that are great. They stick around for a little while and then they move on because they need to do something better for their careers. But you've put the processes and stuff in place to bring the next person on and do the same thing. And it links me back to some key data points, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of if the, the structure and the KPIs and everything is orientated around outcomes that they're wanting that aren't linked to learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. If they're linked to an outcome that's not in their control, they can influence it, but it's in other people's control. I think it puts a, an interesting dynamic and pressure of saying one thing, but then creating the systems process and even data recognition of something else. You know, it's, mm -hmm. Uh, how many sales did you win versus how many experiments did you do to find different ways to make that sale? Right. Um, you know, and ultimately as a company, yeah, you need the sales. And, but you're saying, no, we want to learn and we want to ask loads of questions. We want to do these things, but for how long? And I think the, a lot of these things are the, uh, the, it, the devil's in the detail, right. Of the, the terms of that. Okay. Experiment on what terms when it's really high risk, when it's low risk in this area or this area, and mm -hmm. can I learn mm -hmm. here or actually, no, we haven't, we can't learn on a live patient that needs heart surgery. Cause I think I'm going to try it. Cause it's try something new Friday. <laughs> um, right. So I think there needs to be some still guardrails and restrictions. And maybe this comes to an area where technology can play to give us these virtual places and virtual realms and we've done it for a long time, right? Simulations, mm -hmm. uh, simulating whether that's oil rigs or, you know, big equipment to go and play on it where the stakes are less if you get it wrong. Computer games, play, mm -hmm. get it wrong, reload. <laughs> <laughs> um, work and life it doesn't have a reload, a rebutton, a go back to save, last saved place. Yet I think business needs some of those areas in, yeah. in our rapid experimentation so in terms of what what part can data visualization play in moving us to more experimental more failure um open more question whether it's company or culture or wherever uh just fostering those kind of environments where could data visualization and data analytics come to play in that transition for companies because a lot of them are facing it right they have this desire but they're very different currently today to where they maybe want to be what yeah. are the tricks or ways that they could use analysis uh, you know analytics or visualizations to help them i think the first thing is they need to make sure they start going in the right direction so you don't just bring in tools and tell people hey we're going to start doing data analysis and data visualization. You have to you have to empower the people and you have to give them the training and the tools that they need to be successful in that. And every, for every company, the tools can be different. Uh, you know, I focus on Tableau, but Tableau is not the right tool for every company. Um, you you need to figure out what's best for for your company. And maybe that means experimenting with different tools to see what's right. Maybe you have one team try this and you have another team try that. But it, you have to start in the right direction. The leadership has to be willing to, 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 uh, to give that time for people to learn, uh, especially if it's brand new in a company. And most companies say they're data driven, but they're not. Um, they've never really done data analysis. They've done reporting, which are two very different things. So if they really want to do data analysis, you know, the, the, the people have to have the skills to do that. And how are you going to do that if you don't have those skills in-house? Well, you need to bring somebody in to help you do that, right? That's where sometimes it's better to throw money at the problem, right? <laughs> Rather than uh, rely on one person in the company that happens to know it that now has to do all of the work. Or you make them a manager, which is the worst thing you can do because now they're not productive anymore, right? Um, so, 
Now, data visualization is just a piece of data analysis. It helps communicate the findings, which is a very important part as well. Um, data visualization tends to come at the end, but sometimes they go together. So the part of the analysis might be creating the charts and graphs because it's easier to, it's quicker to interpret charts and graphs than it is tables of numbers. So that's where the two things blend together, but ultimately it comes down to the commitment that a company wants to make to being data-driven and to use, um, you know, to, to use that data to make decisions that are going to drive the company forward. And I guess the, the challenge is then still, so I've got some great data, I've got some great visualizations, is then assuming it was the right data that we were collecting, yeah. <laughs> it's accurate, all of those things, is then listening to it when it says something that we don't like uh, or didn't expect. And, you know, being able to inspire people to, um, you know, not only be, as you said, data driven between reporting, but then also the ability to tell stories, to to mm -hmm. take people along a journey of, OK, if we do this, what's the outcome now going to look like? Paint me a picture of those things. What's it mm. going to be like living in the UK and going to university in different places and those things versus, oh, we've got to get this plane. You, you've only got 20 kilos in your bag. You've got this bit. You've got to have these sorts of things that often we so focus in the how. But you asked, you, you mentioned something very early on was ask people why. Mm -hmm. And I think at the other end, when we have this data and this visualization, why this decision is now one that we should be making or, or critical to right. be made. Um, and the the other thing I wanted to dig into, because I, I recognize our time, is we now have access to, with a small amount of information and understanding and education, some interesting data visualization and analytics work through AI. Mm -hmm. right? We can throw in some, you know, pretty messy data, uh, if it's good data or even better, and ask it, tell me how to understand this better. What mm -hmm. should I look at? Mm -hmm. Should I do factor analysis? Should I do this sort of thing? You know, what should what even are those things? Can you visualize that up for me? Um, and then can you give me some insights from this? So yeah. I've got a visualization. Can you give me insights? That's great. Absolutely great. What do you think that's going to do for companies and for the industry and particularly for people who work inside data where there is now that access to do those kind of things that were hard by the few that really needed to understand software tools and mathematics to now if i can talk i um, and ask the questions then some software can do that for me uh, yeah. so what's the kind of future of the the industry and how do you think it's evolving um empowered by AI and technologies like yeah. that. So AI is the next buzzword. Uh, so of course it is, it is great. You know, it's a, it's a real thing. It's here to stay, but companies think they have to use AI now because everybody else is, they're worried about falling behind, but they have no idea what it means. There's no strategy to do it. They don't know uh, how they're going to use it to influence the business. They just think they have to use it. And the problem with that is they'll, they'll use it, in the wrong way and not know they're using it in the wrong way. They're going to get answers from the AI that actually aren't the answers that are in the data because they don't have then the people to interpret those results, right? To say, you know what, this doesn't look quite right. Or, you know, the, the data analyst hopefully doesn't go away because then you're trusting that the computers are always right. And the computers, ultimately, the AI bots, they're just programmed by people. Right? So ultimately, there's a person behind this whole thing that has to do that data interpretation. They just wrote you know, some code or something that, that makes the process easier, but you have to have checks and balances and you have to have that strategy of moving forward. And my biggest, I, I think what's going to happen is companies are going to just start using it. They're going to say, oh, I can ask this questions of this data and they're going to make decisions based on what a chat bot tells them and not think about the implications of that. Is it right? Um, and they have to build up that trust with it, right? So it, it could be the right decision. Hopefully they are the right, the right answers that they're getting back. But my fear is they're going to just, from the very beginning, assume that everything's Believe right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a bit like, you know, a calculator will do mathematical calculations correctly. I might push the wrong buttons on it. 
right? yeah. and yeah. previously before that we wanted to see all the workings out now we kind of just don't we just put it in there and assume that that's the correct answer yeah you know in my creative world if we presented an idea to a client that was a scamp with you know pencils and things they would see it and treat it through those lenses as an idea if we right. high fidelity visual did up too much, they think it was too done and right. view it differently, not like a concept. So I think the interesting thing that you've just talked about there of because I put it into code interpreter or I put it into an AI interface is going to be right, right versus treat it as the pencil sketch <laughs> at this stage, maybe to go, OK, this is this is interesting. It's been helpful. It's done a lot of heavy lifting. Now I know at the 10 I've just played with, those are the two that are really interesting. I want to get those checked mm -hmm. um, and get someone to work on there. So it could, again, go from this noise to simplification. And so we could experiment, explore, and this balance between at what point do we trust the answer? Because I could give it a person that's been trained by Andy uh, or not trained by Andy, and they might get it right or wrong, let alone right. AI getting it right. Or wrong, right? <laughs> you know, well, you might not ask have... it the right question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's going to give you the answer. Like you said, it's going to give you the answer to whatever question you ask. Yeah. And it, one of the best things I've been using myself and I've uh, asked all of our team to do is when we're working, particularly with things like uh, ChatGPT or uh, Gemini now or ver various different things is ask it to ask you questions, mm. you know, ask me questions before responding. And it's like, oh, well, I hadn't thought about those 10 things that might help you answer better. Right. If I'm going to yeah. give a brief to a person who has an ability likelihood is they'll ask me questions that i didn't know because it's their area of expertise right oh, you know uh, can you make me a cup of tea and they'll say well do you want milk or not do you want sugar or not i might not have even known that those things were part of it because all i ever saw was just a tea mm -hmm. and in data you know when you're looking at it or anything with ai don't be afraid to ask it to ask you some questions and you right. might be surprised uh in some of those mm -hmm. so as we come to the end i i've got a question that i ask everybody andy in my podcast and it's linked to learning it's linked to curiosity and of course it's linked to adaptability right and the question is when was the last time you did something for the first time and what was it the last time I did something for the first time, probably cold calling people. Uh, I'd never done that before because I never had to. I was never in sales before. So that was really interesting, but I prepared for it ahead of time as well. I asked people, you know, hey, I've never done this before. What would you do? I got sent a couple of videos and some Notion templates and and I just used it as like, it probably, probably came off very robotic to the customer, but um, it was so insightful and so meaningful. And I was able to bring out, you know, what are all the problems the customer is having before I even talked, right? I just, it was like, I'm interviewing them. And then at the end, I realized, well, this is a solution I can provide you to get rid of all these problems. How does that sound? Right. But they've talked themselves into it the whole way. And it was just, it's, it's like a human behavior study. It's like, you know, it's so, so interesting, but having never done that before getting on my first sales call, being like super nervous, like this could really crash and burn to just making it a conversation. Like I'm interviewing somebody for a podcast, you know, you just be friendly. You just ask some questions, you show curiosity, you show, you know, that you want to help them, uh, but you don't be pushy. Right? You let them ultimately decide for themselves that that's the solution they need. I, I loved my coach, a chap called Dan Sullivan, and he, he positioned something that's really resonated with me for many years, and it's always be the buyer. And mm. so you're actually buying that person's problem or challenge yeah. uh, or issue rather than you're selling them your solution. Because there's so many that exist out there. Which one do you want to buy from right. <laughs> um, to allow your resources, your time, your knowledge, your your mm -hmm. piece? And it's an interesting just flip of that funnel from, ah, I need loads of them. Let's put them in. I need to line up. OK, what are their pains and gains against this, against this piece? And hopefully down the other end of the funnel, I'll get somebody who says yes. Yeah. Um, and says, no, you've got to qualify to come in. You know, uh, how much do you care about this? particular problem is it a problem i understand is it a yeah. one that resonates and it sounds to me like 
it was something new. You asked other people who had done it before for their recommendations and thoughts. You prepared for it and then you went and did it and you yeah. got your own data. You got your own insights. And it sounds like you've already uncovered some really good gems of something that resonates for you, of your yeah. approach, of your style. Yeah, it's changed the way that I communicate with people too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a much more empathetic toward their problems. Um, I listen better. Um, you know, it's just been it's been super. I love learning new things, and I've never done sales before, so I see this as you know I've got this great opportunity to learn how to do this. You know, how why cool. am I? Not, I'd be dumb not to take advantage of it. How cool! Yeah, it's a new country called sales, and you've just gone and <laughs> I moved on, on, gone and moved there. <laughs> you know, you, you yeah. you've got a little vacation time over in uh, Planet Sales. Yeah, yeah, and you're gonna hang out. You're gonna learn. And you're going to decide, is this for me? Is it not for me? I'm going to do it for a bit. And then I'll find somebody who likes to live there. Yeah. Um, and that's what happens, right? As we evolve through, you know, build, borrow or buy, as we evolve our talent, as we evolve our companies. And Andy, I'm excited to hear that you're venturing out um, to uncover your next chapter. Uh, I did want to, but I think we're out of time. I put in, because um, you're the first person that I've seen a data visualization chart of their resume quite in the way that yours is. And so you Ooh, have that's, to, I haven't updated that in a long time either. Well, interestingly, I put it into um, ChatGPT and said, give me a oh, 90 wow. word story based on this resume chart. And I want it in the style of an adventure story about Andy using, and for those, uh, actually, I wonder if it, those who aren't uh, watching the video version won't be able to see this, but... Uh, while I'm getting this uh, visualization oh up, do you want to? Uh, How do you even find it? Describe it on my website. It was on your website. Okay. <laughs> describe what it is. I'm going to just place it into, I think, my, my there we go. Yeah. screen. Oh, wow. There. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so I think I last updated this probably when I moved to the UK. Okay. So okay. It's, miss it's missing things as well. Yeah. So I'm going to just place it there in the corner. And as we, uh, just before we close out, so this is an image, it's a timeline and there's kind of five categories to it of uh, blogging, career, education, uh, residence and volunteering. So the types of what these are and then a timeline of these activities and then uh, <laughs> where they span. And it was, it was quite interesting. And this is the 90 word story for you, Andy, that it came out with as an adventure story. So it uh, goes like this. Uh, Andy Kriebel, uh, Andy Kriebel's life is a mosaic of innovation and adaptability from the halls of Clemson to the vibrant tech scene of San Francisco. He's transformed data into stories that captivate and educate, a journey marked by transitions from healthcare analytics to the pinnacle of Facebook. He's a maestro of data visualizations. As a coach, author, and community leader, Andy's path is a thrilling odyssey throughout the evolving landscape of data, teaching others to navigate the seas of change with the compass um, of adaptability. Now, that is interesting because we've, you know, I've used one that has some pre-programmed elements of our tone and style and what we are as sure. being AQ of those things. But the power of just from graphics, from, you know, visualizations, how different things interpret it, how you might have interpreted it, yeah. having lived it, me looking at it to say, should I interview this guy? Should I hire this person? Or, you know, right. a piece of software looking at it and with an instruction saying, create a 90 word story yeah. about it. That was, that was absolutely fascinating. I mean, it, it, it did a really good job of summing up how I feel about things and my approach to things. And, uh, you know, the tone made me sound really smart. Uh, <laughs> But that's really, really interesting the way that it the way that it pieced it together and and sectioned it out yeah, between gave education it a narrative. and work and yeah. and uh, you know and coaching and all of that. I mean, super interesting. I have to steal isn't that, it? isn't it? They, they, well, I'll send it through, Andy. Yeah. It's you know, the, I, I have I have a good AI story if you're interested. Go on, so, then. hit me with it. Hit me with it. I was looking to. Uh, uh, no, this is when, this is when I had my, uh, my, my baby. So kind of unexpected, you know, a couple of weeks early, 
uh, all of a sudden had to leave. So I had to write an out of office message. And uh, so I used ChatGPT to help me write the out of office message. And I got it right to the point where I really liked it. And then I said, rewrite this in the tone of Ricky Gervais. And it was absolutely epic. It was so good. <laughs> Did you use it? Did you use it? I, absolutely. Yeah, it was great. Excellent. It was so funny. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. And why shouldn't life and work be a smile, be a joy, be an adventure. Yeah. And so an adventure story that's been with just a, opening the next chapter of yours, Andy. I look forward to collaborating, observing what you're up to, what the you know new adventure that you're starting out on. And I'm confident that our community, our support, would want to get in touch with you and understand how they can use their own volumes of data in their own practices, in their own coaching, consulting, or in their organizations. If they want mm. to reach out to you, Andy, how do they do that? Well, LinkedIn is probably the best way. Um, so it's just LinkedIn. Uh, just look up Andy Kriebel. I think I'm probably the only one on there. Um, and then you could also email me, just andy at andykriebel.com. Very simple. Um, and I'm happy to talk you through what I do. Um, I've got, you know, different websites I can send you that explain um, all the training offerings I have and, and things. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to chat with anybody that might want to work. Fantastic. It's been an absolute pleasure. Really enjoyed. And to let you know, I probably got through about half of my planned questions because we're okay. uh, yeah. setting up <laughs> and that's part of the course, right? Yeah. You, you adapt to where the energy and the flow goes. So thank you so much for your time today, Andy. Yeah, thank you. Do you have the level of adaptability to survive and thrive the rapid changes ahead? Has your resilience got more comeback than a yo-yo? Do you have the ability to unlearn in order to reskill, upskill and break through? Find out today and uncover your adaptability profile and score, your AQ. Visit aqai.io to gain your personalized report across 15 scientifically validated dimensions of adaptability. For a limited time, enter code PODCAST65 for a complimentary AQ Me assessment. AQ AI, transforming the way people, teams, and organizations navigate change. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast directory, and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.